Moderator, you can now take over. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody, from wherever you are watching, from all parts of the world. This is the Ruforum webinar, a preparation for the Ruforum annual general meeting, which we hold in Cameroon in October 2023. This afternoon, we are going to have a brief discussion on the team transforming university processes, systems, and learning experience. We have put together for you a panel of experts. But first, before we go into the issues, we have Professor Florence Ufe Chinje Melo, the rector of the University of Ngaoundere, who is one of the board persons of the roof of the roof forum. We also have the host this afternoon, who is Professor Patrick Okori, the Executive Secretary of Ruforum. So you're welcome, and we are glad to have you this, after this afternoon. But first, we are going to give the opportunity to um, Madam Professor, board member Florence Ufe Chinje, the rector of the University of Gaoundere to make an opening remark to the viewers of this webinar. Professor Ufe Chinje, over to you. We should have the microphone open for the. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes, Professor. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, as you said, the theme of today is transforming university processes, systems, and learning experience. Uh, so I welcome everybody on to this uh, webinar on this 31st day of May 2023. So I'll start with uh, Professor Peterson. Rector of the and Vice Chancellor, University of Free State, South Africa, and keynote speaker, Professor Patrick Okori, Ruforum Executive Secretary, speakers and panelists, participants at this webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Today we live in a globally competitive and world driven and defined by large scale knowledge based transformation of our economies and lives. This, these rapid shifts have underpinned the importance of education and science in shaping modern societies that have increased between the, 21st, the 20th and the 21st centuries. Education and science, and specifically science, technology, and innovation has consequently become a strong pillar in redefining the job content and content across various economic sectors and countries. And that's why today we say science, technology, and innovation are the game changers. And we see today universities are not still on their standard methods of teaching, but we're looking more into what we say entrepreneurial universities. And uh, in Cameroon, for example, recently the Minister of State launched what he called for state universities, one student, one entrepreneur. So Africa is on the race to catch up, to close the weak development indicators, to respond to the several challenges facing the continent. Higher education, over the years has been seen as a quasi passport to escape poverty. So I'm sure today we are asking ourselves that question, are we playing that role? Ladies and gentlemen, higher education institutions therefore have to live with the realities 
shaping their current operations. Accordingly, university processes, systems, and learning experiences ought to be rapidly adaptive to the emerging trends. The first recorded protest against calculators used by math teachers in modern times was in 1966 and again in 1988. However, if the same teachers that protested in those, those years are still alive today, would even be more awed by the revelations in computing capacities that is happening. We are now living in a different world, in a world of artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence enabled and driven learning. History seems to have repeated itself with the recent only protest against the use of chat GPT app in higher education learning. We need to move ahead. We need to embrace modernity as we move in higher education. Ladies and gentlemen, as higher education institutions, we cannot afford to be on the opposing side of advancement. It is our responsibility to understand the past, lead in the future, and lead in the present, sorry, and predict the future and prepare for it and lead it. To do this, we need to be aggressively adaptive, agile, and committed to change. Transformation is thus inevitable in the way we do business as universities. This means our processes, systems, and learning experiences we deliver to students entrusted to us have to transform and be transformative in all measures. We know we have a huge challenge in Africa where we learn only 30% of the youths find employment. And this, we know knowledge is built around the universities and we have to play our role. Today's webinar on transforming university processes, systems and learning experiences is a second webinar on the Transforming Higher Education webinar series. It is convened as part of the 19th Ruforum Annual General Meeting, which will be hosted in Yaoundé, Cameroon from the 28th of October to the 3rd of November, 2023. This webinar seeks, among, two, among others, call on university leaders, education practitioners, and development partners to rethink learning and how learning is delivered in higher education in Africa. To call on university leaders and development practitioners to discuss the need to rethink university entry and admissions requirements and processes <clears throat> with intent to break the status quo that currently appears to ingrain inequality and exclusion. To explore the concerns of social safeguards for livable and fulfilling universities within the process of reflecting an agile university leading change. Ladies and gentlemen, I call upon you then to be actively engaged in this conversation, raise questions through the various channels available and be engaged, I repeat, to be totally engaged. This discussion is for all of us and in particular for the future of our continent, when no one should be left behind. The challenges are huge, but I am convinced we are up to the task. Finally, permit me to use this platform to welcome all of you to Yaoundé, Cameroon, for the 19th Forum AGM, which as I said earlier, will be holding from the 28th of October to the 3rd of November, 2023. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Professor Florence Ufechinje, but and room AGM to be held here in Yaoundé in Cameroon. 
If you are just joining us, my name is Professor Ernest Litia Muloa, the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Cooperation and Relations with the Business World of the University of Bamenda, the University of the Future. For the from the board member, we will move straight the discussion of our team this afternoon, university processes, systems, and learning experience. We have aligned a series of resource persons. Uh, without much ado, I will hand over the uh, microphone to, um, to our host, uh, Professor Pat Patrick Okori, who is going to welcome you into the reform platform and into the reform house. Professor Patrick Okori is the executive secretary of reform. Professor Okori. Thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you, Professor Anes Maloa, Deputy VC, uh, University of Bamenda, who has accepted to be our moderator today. Thank you for a job well done. We were struggling a bit with the internet and that's why I joined rather late. But I'm very delighted to see that we have close to 70 plus people participating in, uh, in this webinar and they continue joining. I want to thank you all for taking time to join this webinar. It's important that Africa can sit and dialogue, talk to each other and talk with each other. So to that extent, therefore, I want to thank Professor Wiche for uh, giving us welcome marks, remarks to, to, to Professor Chinje for giving us welcome remarks to, 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 to the webinar and more importantly, for reminding us all that we are going to have uh, a great meeting in Cameroon from the 28th to to the third or the second of, uh, of, uh, of, of November. So uh, this webinar series is one of those that has been arranged in preparation for that. It is titled Transforming University Processes, Systems and Learning. As you all know, a good part of the, of the conference this year is going to focus on transforming higher education to the extent that it will enable our economies to better be able to support our agri-food system transformation, a talk that has been going on in the UN since last year. But before I go far, may I acknowledge our keynote presenter for today, Professor Francis Peterson, who is the Vice Chancellor, University of Free State, and also a forum board member. Permit me also acknowledge the Rector of the University of Gaudere, who is also invited us today, Professor Florence Chinjen. And then uh, permit me also to thank uh, some of our other partners on board, Dr. Spire Sentongo, who is a senior lecturer at Makere University, Matthias Mobius, who is a co-founder of uh, Smart Hub Africa. It's a private sector um, a partner. And then Ariel Sanchez, who will be joining us as well, or could be already on, on online, from, who is director of admissions from Earth University, Costa Rica. This is a university that is implementing a unique way of training, so it would be good to listen to them. Professor Justin uh, Namalwa, who is the head of the Scholars Program here at Makere University. The Scholars Program is funded by MasterCard and aims really to intensify how um, young people can be more engaged in the work um, uh, life in Africa. All members of Reforum's governing board and its organs present online, distinguished participants of this webinar in your various capacities, especially our students, the academic staff or faculty, development and policy partners. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this second webinar series of Reforum organizing the run up to the annual general meeting that will be held in Yaounde, as has already been introduced from 28th October to the 2nd of November. Distinguished participants, allow me to make a few more remarks. On behalf of the Reforum management and on my own behalf, we thank our host, the government of Cameroon, really for accepting to host the AGM. And this meeting is a run up to that meeting that 
uh, will take place towards the end of October. I'm also very grateful that our universities in Cameroon are making every effort to make sure we hold a memorable AGM. We just came back from Cameroon two weeks ago and a lot of steps have been made to accommodate all of you in Cameroon. So we look forward to seeing you and meeting you in person. Distinguished participants, in fact, the very presence of senior leadership from our host member universities online for this meeting today, the Rector of the University of Gaudere, the DVC, Deputy Vice Chancellor, University of Mamenda, they attest to that fact that we have good hosting and planning for us all to be in Cameroon. So let's work all the uh, 24 hours to ensure we make Cameroon memorable. And now the, web the webinar topic for today is transforming university processes, systems, and learning experience. It is an important topic because the hope of Africa harnessing its youth population dividend lies in synchronizing our education system to the contemporary and emerging futures of Africa and the global economy. As you all probably know, by 2050, Africa will be contributing the largest human resources than any other continent um, on the globe. But where will these people find work? I mean, we'll have the largest population of working age, but in order to turn that population of working age into workers, a lot has got to be done. So allow me to speak to some of the reasons why this topic was chosen and why it is important as part of the webinar series. Number one, our challenges are facing a lack of skilled professionals to underpin development. And research is one of those areas that are heavily constrained. We have an increasingly aging uh, population of scientists. The ratio of scientists per, per, per unit of development, when you compare the ratio of our scientists, say to farmers, it is too lopsided to have any major effect. And that needs to be looked to across all sectors, including agriculture. Africa's working age is, is growing at about 3% per annum and expected to generate about 450 million young people who will be ready to work by 2035. But our economy can only employ three people as you are all aware. And yet the work-life transitions in Africa are also changing from being employed to being self-employed. Most of these are, are going to be in agriculture and other emerging services sector which is increasingly taking a bigger role in most of our economies as they transition from primary production to value addition and integrate into other areas of the global economy. For example, studies by the Brookings Institute show that three quarters of new entrants into Africa's labor market are going to be self-employed or in micro enterprises. Only 20% of these 420 million I talked about will be wage employed. Meanwhile, just four to 5% can be employed by industry. The main message is that only 100 million out of these 450, a quarter, will be expected to be working by 2035. That leaves us with 350,000 young people. What do we do with them? Or what will we do with them? Or what can we do for them so that we can increase that number, maybe double or even triple it. And so you can see why this seminar is very important. Our education sector must therefore develop the appropriate skilling and training programs that produce workers for today and tomorrow. But in comparison on the rest of the globe, we don't have that many higher education institutes. And yet our human resource pyramid is highly imbalanced. The ratio of professors to senior lecturers and all the way down to development practitioners is really lopsided. Sometimes you have more highly qualified people than the thousands of uh, development practitioners we need. Thanks due to the closure of some of our training programs over two decades ago, and in many countries, there are hardly any technical vocational education training institutes that link up to universities and produce the diploma cert certificate baccalaureate type of training. And this is really making our development processes very difficult. And this is where the bulk of our people are going to be absorbed. Moreover, gender and cultural biases especially affect girls, increasing the unemployment inequity. 
Wars create refugees, and we are locking out so many young people out of their future livelihood. These are part of the 450. So we must do something as universities to contribute towards closing that gap. And I see this webinar and many other activities that your forum and higher education institutes are undertaking as a window of opportunity for us to develop the next generation of Africa's working force by leveraging these same opportunities and challenges that we see around. If we don't do something about it, the 10 to 13 million youth entering the workforce annually will always remain in statistics. We will only get one third of these into the job as has been raised by, uh, by the previous speaker. So to fill this gap, training must be realigned to address the issues we have, the gender and diversity gap closures, the way we manage students and, and, and handle different types of challenges they face. Somebody recently reminded me of the, 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 the nature of anger that exists among our young people, mostly due to dissatisfaction with the quality of services they have. Many of our universities do not even have a good psychosocial support for these young men. No wonder they are always going on strike. So we need to give them skills, but we need to give them psychosocial support as well. We need to equip them with, um, with the technical, but we need to address all other kinds of areas of leadership that will help them to be the leaders that Africa and the world needs. So distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, this webinar series marks the second now in our pre-webinar series. And I'm sure, as I can see already, has attracted a very diverse audience to deliberate on this important issue of how we can put in place processes, systems, and make sure that ensure the learning experience by our young people is a memorable one and impactful to their lives. And so while thanking you all for logging in to be part of this conversation this afternoon, it is now my single honor to welcome you all to this webinar and encourage you to post your comments on our chat, and uh, there will be other guidance. We have an Arabic channel if you do not speak uh, French or English. There is also an, a French channel that you can log on, and then you should be able to participate. The outcome of this webinar series are going to be published collectively as thought pieces that will inform the annual general meeting, among others, in, in Yaounde at the end of October. So with that, a, a Sam moderator, I yield back my time and deeply thank you all for supporting this webinar series. I wish you great de deliberation. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Professor Patrick Okori, the Executive Secretary of Ruforum. Ruforum is the regional universities forum for capacity building of faculties and institutions of agriculture in the continent of Africa. The headquarters is in Kampala, Uganda. Now move straight to our keynote and I shall be handing over back to the secretariat to um, allow the keynote speaker to be able to share his screen and his materials, then I will do an introduction of the keynote speaker. Secretary, please. In the meantime, if you have questions, you have questions, you can post them in the Q&A section in the chat box, as well as other information, observations, comments. You can also post them in the chat bo box and be able to chat with colleagues, uh, with colleagues online. Thank you so much. Is our keynote speaker ready?
Yes. We can go to the next. Okay. Um. If I may, the keynote speaker has not yet joined, so let's just have the discussions go ahead. Let's okay, just thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Um, therefore, it's an opportunity for me to um, to invite um, Matthias Matthias Mobius to be able to talk to us this afternoon. Uh, Matthias is the is the co-founder of Start Hub Africa. He is going to talk about tools for competitiveness and thriving in the marketplace. Uh, Matthias, are you ready? And over to you, please. I'm ready. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Over to you. Big pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Matthias. I've been dialing in from Kampala, Uganda. Um, thanks for, for this opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm giving a short intro about the work that we do and probably why, why I'm here and uh, share my few cents on this topic of skills for competitiveness. Um, and uh, very shortly, I live here in Uganda since 2017. Uh, I'm originally from Germany, uh, Munich. I studied physics. So I actually, um, I, I experienced myself what it means basically coming from science, but then getting into the space of entrepreneurship and really using diverse skills and retrospectively reflecting what in my university career helped me and prepared me to doing something very different than what I studied. And I think this is also the reality of a lot of students on the African continent. So um, there's actually a few learnings from that. Uh, I'm a co-founder at StartHub Africa. Um, I, it, it was called SmartHub before. I like that a lot. Maybe we will call ourselves SmartHub from now instead of StartHub. So we'll consider that for sure. Um, I like that a lot, but um, in short, what do we do at StartHub? We um, are a entrepreneurship hub um, and we are a hybrid social enterprise. So we run a commercial arm and we donate all our profits to ourselves to do mostly one core thing um, through our nonprofit. And that is to build functional entrepreneurship structures and systems and education across universities. So we have MOUs with 12 universities in Uganda and Tanzania. We've worked with universities in six East African countries through different projects. We have an MOU with IUCEA, which is the Inter-University Council for East Africa, which is an East Africa-wide um, higher education umbrella body that is doing amazing work across the region. Um, and so we have a lot of years of experience working with institutions and at institutions of, of higher learning to transform um, the way how specifically entrepreneurship education is happening. Um, we do that in two different ways. One is a bottom-up approach, and this is mostly what we started with when we were a small organization. Um, and this is very, very possible through working with the student communities because they are very open to um, adopting um, uh, different opportunities and so on. But by now, we also work top-down together with the administration, with different faculties um, to create entrepreneurship curricula and programs that are actually part of of the regular teaching, but that work very differently than the normal rather school-like education sometimes, and are super hands-on and practice-oriented and, um, and try to also break open some silos. So a few cents on this topic of skills for competitiveness. I think um, from what I've seen and uh, we have heard in the, in the great um, speech in the, in the introductions that the world is changing, right? Um, I think Professor Florence mentioned the word future around 20 times and I think this is exactly what we need. Um, there is a mismatch and this, is, this can get uh, bigger because the way how higher education has been done um, in the last decades, it's not, it's not viable anymore, right? It's less and less about um, transferring only knowledge. While this still remains, of course, in the uh, sciences and everywhere core part, but also about skills for the future. Um, and so the way how education happens needs to equip specifically for skills. And I see that universities have a big responsibility to adjust their way of working to specifically find ways to teach skills that equip for the future. Um, so how, how can this look like and what 
uh, what, what are the requirements here? So maybe one big thing is that the world is changing rapidly, right? And there is so much knowledge out there, but um, the knowledge base um, can be can be accessed in so many ways. There's amazing lectures online. Content, the value of content is rather low by now because you can you can access it for free in in high quality in many places and ways. Um, a lot of the top notch universities globally put their lectures online. You can literally learn along. Um, and so knowledge is not the key ingredient um, anymore, but other skills, such as, for example, learning how to learn on your own. And I benefited in my studies a lot from that because there was no requirements for me of how I attend courses. I didn't have to attend any lecture. There were semesters when some lectures I didn't, I didn't go a single time. I, I went to the exam and I, I saw my professor for the first time. And while this is not maybe sometimes ideal, they... Uh, enabled us to learn remotely and to access all the learning that they gave us and all the practice-based parts, I did them. Um, and I still was able to, to, to learn and study. And I think this is, this is quite important that universities and also lecturers um, adjust to this changing, rapidly changing environment. Um, and so this aspect of learning how to learn on your own and scheduling your own um, Time and self-organization are key skills that need to be learned at university to be also future ready. And um, the, the, the framework needs to account for it and allow for it as well. Um, so then the question also becomes, how do you learn these soft and hard skills like learning how to learn? Um, learning how to how to become more confident, um, learning how to gain the various soft skills that you need in this rapidly changing market environment where knowledge gets outdated in two years. Um, so these are the key things that different learning and teaching formats finally need to capture um, and and give to the students so that they are equipped. It's more about this equipment with the skills um, going forward. And uh, there are very concrete ways how this, this can happen. Um, so maybe how do I look at the job of universities looking uh, going forward, considering this idea of um, doing more skills-based um, training? Number one, um, and uh, I want to cite because we have worked very much also as a venture builder. Um, we've worked very much um, also in the investment space. And I want to want to give a figure um, that around 65% of founders of venture capital backed African startups studied abroad. 65% um, of those that raised $20 million or more. So of the large ones. And why is that? It's not that the students who study abroad are smarter but they are more exposed. They are more exposed and they have different other ways how to widen their personal perspective. And this is something that universities can definitely, and it's also happening, but need to do more um, to, to, um, to give this to the students here locally in East Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa and so on, on the ground. So one of the jobs of the universities is to enable students get diverse exposure. And this sometimes requires to break open silos faster. Um, there is a conversation also in Uganda here um, on how to do that better, how to collaborate more with the private sector, um, how to um, involve students or, or to actively use teaching methods um, that are um, using the, the most current tools. Uh, Professor Florence once again mentioned GPT and AI and how it affects learning. So to give them the exposure so that they are ready for the job market and can, can take their own steps. Um, then it's about equipping with capabilities, not only knowledge, then it's also what the universities have to do is to enable diverse formats of learning. So not only the classical teaching that is happening in the classroom, um, but going way beyond that. And, help, and I'll have a few examples from, um, from formats that we've done very successfully. Um, and, and then enabling that there are diverse activities happening on the ground at the universities is very important. What I mean, for example, is that me personally, I benefited a lot from extracurricular activities. Um, and as a physicist, my studies were hardcore science. But 
in these extracurricular activities, I um, learned about business ethics. I learned about sustainable developments in, uh, in the economy. I got into social entrepreneurship. And all this was only possible because the universities provided a framework with, with, within which such, such groups and activities could flourish and they were actually being supported and that helped us as students. So maybe lastly, a few very concrete things that we have seen work. Number one is to make teaching and learning more practice-based. And I think this is a, um, a, a long-standing criticism sometimes that it can be very school-like, especially if you look into the business faculty, sometimes it's very management-heavy, but very few students actually will graduate and get into management-related jobs because they are just not there. Um, so more practice-based teaching will help to gain um, actual skills and learn how to do things that can be applied in a diverse set of contexts, um, which the students will be subjected to. Case study-based learning. Together with the University of Dar es Salaam and with the IT faculty, um, we created a one-year um, program for their students that is part of the curriculum and in which, um, and, and I really love how University of Dar es Salaam is very, very forward looking there, which is very case study based. There's a lot of case study teachings. How did actually um, Tanzanian startups make it? What were the success factors? How do they, did they start? Um, so that you learn from the real examples and um, get, get some of the myths out of the way which helps you to finally um, think more around how can you start your own business. Then project-based learning. We are right now implementing in Uganda um, an interesting program called Innovate for Employment, in which we will connect um, the student entrepreneurship communities that we have at universities in Uganda with the private sector. And we will do things like um, uh, gathering problem statements from the private sector and companies and um, students will be working on a project basis on these problem statements. So they will interface with, um, with the companies. So in comparison to the regular internships, it's actually very much need-based and they do something that is valuable to the companies. At the same time, they are guided and learn how to professionally set up and execute on a project. And this gives real life skills that they can apply, uh, apply immediately. Then um, I think uh, another thing is, uh, as I already mentioned, to allow and actively embrace that extracurricular activities happen because a lot, a lot of learnings come from these. Um, and if I just look at our team, we're around 25 people full-time. Um, very many of them were in student communities such as ISAC, et cetera. And this is really where they implemented certain things and learned beyond the normal um, university learning. So if universities can, can, can do that in a more active way and also programs, projects, I think this is very, very valuable. Um, and any other kind of exposure to get back to that example that universities can provide outside the regular teachings is extremely helpful in this diverse and very fast changing world. Um, so much from my end. I hope that's helpful. And thank you so much for inviting me. Excited to be part of these conversations. Thank you and greetings from Uganda. Thank you so much, Matthias. Matthias has expounded how the, we need to engage and put effort in transforming university processes, systems, and learning experience, perhaps in the 21st century with different strategies and approaches. He talked about knowledge with capabilities, project-based uh, learning, and for us to embrace extracurricular activity as modes of learning, including diverse and many other strategies that he outlined for us. Um, we, we are going to take the next presenter. Um, he is Jimmy Spire Setongo from Makerere University. Is uh, Jimmy ready for us? Yes, so, thank you, Professor Murua. I, I don't know whether you're able to hear me. Yes, five on five. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, good afternoon or good whatever it is, whatever time it is on your side. 
I'm really happy to be part of this uh, exciting conversation. Uh, when I was invited Im initially, I held some reservations that what would I be talking about here because it appeared that the conversation was more uh, steep towards the sciences, the natural sciences, but I can see already that uh, it's a co conversation that everyone should take interest in. It's about things that uh, anyone interested in education should be you know, concerned about. I'll try to be quite brief because a number of the things that I had wanted to say have been said by the keynote speaker and later by Matthias. It was quite an eloquent uh, presentation. And I uh, I really see that it's in the direction of thought that I as well uh, had. Now, in my speech, in my presentation, I might mention things that sound to be generic, especially about my context, Uganda, but it's not meant to give the impression that Uganda is a one monolithic kind of representation, that if I talk about Uganda's education system, it's one, I'm aware that uh, there is a whole spectrum of uh, differences that you would find in public uh, universities, private universities, and um, also depending on where they are located, but also there are differences within the disciplines. Certain disciplines might be already oriented towards doing some of what we think is ideal. Other disciplines could be more uh, rooted into the traditional approaches. So I am well aware of those uh, uh, diversities. Uh, sorry that I'm not sharing my video because of the uh, the network that I'm using. It's not really that reliable. Maybe I could just turn it on briefly, but for purposes of its stability, I'll have to turn it off. So as we start, um, I'll use a few anecdotes uh, to give context to what I'm going to talk about. One, in many universities in Uganda, it's examination period now. And in the examination period, it's not, you don't find many students on compound. Many are in the library or many are locked up somewhere reading. Uh, of course, I'm only talking about those that would care if they pass exams or not, but you'll find that many are somewhere reading. And you ask yourself that why is it around this time that you find students putting in extra effort, that you find them so committed? Um, beyond attending classes. And I think the answer can be guessed by many of us is because much of our education is examination oriented. It's about passing exams. I've seen students uh, disposing of their material, their books, uh, uh, where they, put, they took lecture notes. I've seen them disposing them off at the end of their third year or fourth year or at the end of their studies. And they will say that they no longer need them. They say, I've finished my studies. What is this for? Because primarily one comes in to get the paper and to get the paper, they need to pass the exams. But I do not put it on the side of the students alone. Also on our side as um, teachers, the side of those who are supposed to guide. The way we train in many ways dictates so it uh, shapes the responses that you'll get from students. If we train in such a way that it becomes clear that what we are interested in testing is memory, what we are uh, interested in testing is if students can um, master what we provide to them and produce them at a time when we ask, then students will be directed in the angle of uh, simply trying to cram, in the angle of simply trying to, uh, to reproduce. And while this might sound a thing of the past in certain places, I know in many of our universities, it's still the practice. And you will find even in the questions that are set in exams, they are mainly questions that require uh, replication. And even the examination approach itself, it's mostly the traditional one where, where they'll have to sit with a set of questions and um, within uh, about maybe three hours, they have to answer to the questions and the answers are in written form. Maybe I should speak specifically to the humanities and social sciences where I'm best, uh, my discipline is philosophy. The answers are written and you ask yourself, well, is this the only way in which we can examine? Is this the only way in which we can test understanding? 
is it the only way in which we can we can know if one has really acquired knowledge and which knowledge that they uh, maybe they could use elsewhere or not and i think the answers will show that it's not the only way and perhaps it's quite limiting there are so many things that we miss by testing that way the other preliminary observation i would make is about the debates we have been having in Uganda regarding uh, the contestation between the natural sciences and the humanities, social sciences. And it appears the stand of government or the stand of those uh, who are on the side of policy is that we need the natural sciences more than the social sciences. And indeed, we have had a number of them, uh, uh, programs in the humanities being scrapped whereby if it's not government initiating or the push for these programs being scrapped, it is the universities themselves. But what is a bit unfortunate in this uh, debate, maybe beyond the fact that the debate itself is not well framed, is that the response of universities is not in calling for more discussion or in trying to direct the debate to say that maybe this is not really a question we should we should even be discussing, or maybe this is how we should be looking at it. It has mostly been a response by trying to adjust to fit within what uh, the politicians are saying, to fit within what a particular person is saying. So the university that is supposed in many ways or expected to be the guide, to be uh, the one that uses uh, maybe the huge experience in the knowledge world, in order to um, uh, to shape conversations on how we should look at knowledge or how we should look at um, uh, skilling or whichever we are, we are discussing. Instead, it becomes uh, the one to be guided primarily. And I'm not trying to say that the university shouldn't listen to voices that are coming from without or from the, uh, the world of practice. Yes, there should be a conversation, but if the place of the university is really geared to that of simply listening and adjusting to what comes from without, then it becomes uh, quite ironic. Uh, it's uh, akin to what some people would say that in such a case, the road is the driver, it's the road that is guiding the driver. So those discussions um, and the other observation I made about exams says a lot about our tertiary, our university education system, much that we should be looking at in trying to um, in trying to come up with ideas on how we think learning should be, you know, how we think our education should be directed. But one would even think that before we even get there, we should be asking more preliminary questions, more fundamental questions. What is education? What is it for? And for what world? What world are we preparing for as we educate? Of course, what world you're preparing for would mean partly that you first understand what education is. And it's a discussion that I don't want to go into. I would imagine that everyone has an idea of education being a process of shaping ourselves, being a process of making ourselves better, but making ourselves better in view of what, uh, which takes us to the purpose. We are making ourselves better in view of what life is about. And life is about so many things. Life isn't just about the jobs. Life isn't all about employment. Unfortunately, in many of our debates on education, we are focusing so much on employment. Yes, it's very important. But if we focus so much in employment, then we are going to get people who are dysfunctional in other parts, um, in other aspects outside their job performance. And not only that, even within the job itself. If we observe in many countries in Africa, and perhaps maybe I would limit it to Uganda, what are some of the key challenges that we are facing now? We will say that maybe one of the key challenges is uh, unemployment, but I think it's bigger than that. One of the key challenges that we are facing in Uganda is the breakdown in honesty, the breakdown in integrity. That much of what we shall plan, be it within the education system, health or wherever, it is affected by corruption. 
corruption that has eaten into every institution. Now, if you simply emphasize skilling, if you simply emphasize uh, um, entrepreneurial skills, if you simply uh, emphasize that uh, we should get more engineers, we should get more doctors, without talking about character, without talking about the role of education in shaping the entire person, in shaping who eventually we ultimately become, not just really getting this to the family, really getting this to the church to say that no, in at higher uh, in universities we simply have to inform the mind, and the mind in terms of thinking about the job, in thinking about uh, innovations, and not to inform the heart or to inform our values. I think we we get it wrong. So in view of those challenges that we are faced with, the increased uh, the selfishness, dishonesty, which I think is contributing as contributing significantly to the unemployment that we are talking about. Uh, when you ask the question, are the ones in the job uh, in different kinds of places, are they the ones that would really deserve to be there? Those that do not have jobs, why don't they have them? Um, even the fact that we are producing, we are, are providing for fewer opportunities, at times, it's, we are not making a headway in making more opportunities because even the, those who are in place, places that should have done that are not the ideal people to be there. So corruption ultimately breaks down everything. And it should be one of the things that we think very seriously about as we are discussing the role, the purpose of education. And as we are thinking about this debate of um, whether it should be the humanities or natural sciences that we focus on, that we concentrate on, we make a wrong assumption that knowledge has boundaries, the same boundaries that we draw between our the different disciplines. That I am from philosophy, and then I would argue that philosophy is different from psychology. We even come up with uh, specific parameters of how to draw those lines. This is psychology, this is philosophy, this is sociology, this is physics, this is chemistry, this is biology, but out there in the world, you find that these lines are not as uh, explicit as we draw them, that instead, there is a lot of overlap, there is a lot of interaction in this knowledge, such that you cannot excel in one aspect of knowledge if you have not in the other. That you may not excel as an engineer, for example, if you have not, um, if you do not have the art of thinking critically, if you do not have the art of imagination, which imagination is not exclusively an engineering aspect. Imagination can come from so many other, um, from so many other sources beyond what the engineering field would provide or what uh, to become a good agriculturist. There are certain other values that you need that are beyond what one would study in agriculture. So the debate has been polluted by that binary. It has been polluted by a false dichotomy of thinking that it is either this or that, and that we cannot think of uh, how the different uh, different areas of knowledge can uh, go together. And the other question that I indicated among those that we have to ask, which Matthias also mentioned, for what kind of world are we pre preparing our products? For what kind of world are we preparing our students? And he mentioned that this is increasingly becoming a fast changing world. So many things change even before you get used to one thing, another is coming in. And what that would tell uh, for us, uh, what it would uh, suggest is that you're preparing a person more to be dynamic. You're preparing a person to think so that they can very easily adapt, they can very easily adjust. Sometimes they, uh, the knowledge that we equip our students with before they even finish their program, it's outdated. Before they finish their degree, they can no longer use that knowledge. But if this person was equipped with knowledge on how to think critically about their situations, on how to analyze their environment, I think it's that knowledge that they can use even to see the opportunities. While part of that knowledge would come, for instance, from uh, let's say logic or critical thinking, which is in philosophy, 
I know it would guide one even within business or in agriculture or in uh, political science or whichever a kind of field. So for a fast changing world, then you do not equip one with uh, static knowledge. And by static knowledge, I don't mean that there is there are no values that are uh, uh, that cut across values that will be relevant beyond times or beyond whatever changes that the flux that we experience. There are certain values, let's say the one of integrity that I talked about that will always be important. Although some people have observed that in certain places like Uganda today, if you have integrity, you're the one to suffer. Actually, it might mean that you cannot even progress with that integrity. You simply have to adapt within uh, to the corruption in order to uh, to survive but all the same it is not sustainable that's the point that i make even if it might make some people prosper for some uh, time it's not really a sustainable kind of society to create because ultimately it works against uh, against itself now what then do we need uh, to do in view of uh, certain things that I've noted, um, the fast changing world, um, uh, the trends that we are seeing today that there is very high gullibility, gullibility even among people that we consider to be educated, gullibility in the context of a world that is producing so much knowledge in the context of a world where knowledge access is becoming much easier. For a person who has a smartphone, every day you're bombarded with, uh, I would say, thousands and thousands of uh, uh, sources of knowledge. But for one who is not equipped on how to navigate around this mass of knowledge, for people who have been used to the challenge that it's knowledge that is difficult to access, and now what they have to deal with is how to, to sieve, how to select we find that we make so many mistakes that we end up in so many ventures that um, there's so many dangerous ventures, wrong ventures that are just because we are unable to receive information that we do not have the imagination, we do not have the aspect of uh, um, uh, the skill of, of telling between what is credible and what is not credible. So what do we then need to do? Minus the aspect of building character that I mentioned. It has been mentioned severally that we have to build uh, our learners capacity to utilize vast resources. I mean, not only the resources in learning, but also resources out there once uh, they are finished uh, with their uh, degree or whatever it is. But this, uh, presupposes other skills. We have talked so much about uh, job creation that we should train job creators, but we do not talk about, maybe not sufficiently, about the skills that job creators would need. For a person to be a job creator, they have to be equipped with capacity to study their situation, their environment. Studying their environment to know what are the opportunities studying the environment to know what are the threats or what are the what are the different ways in which I can navigate navigate it and this may not only come through skills that we get from the study of research but also other skills that we get in uh, uh, the process the entire process of learning the different assignments that we give if you look at research itself and the way it is performed, in many of our universities today, it's quite unfortunate that it's simply turning into a ritual. Universities have contributed, first of all, in um, uh, fossilizing it, it into a very cold structure where everyone has to fit. And students have to cram that, okay, when you talk about research, at the end, I have to produce a dissertation. What is a dissertation? It is a, a report that has the following chapters. Those chapters are well uh, stipulated, introduction, literature review, methodology, uh, findings, uh, conclusion, uh, discussion, conclusion. This does not leave the learner space to imagine, space to create beyond what we already know. This could be one of the ways of uh, disseminating knowledge, but it's not the only one. There are many other possible ones. 
So once the learner is placed in a, an environment or in a, um, uh, in a setting where they simply have to fit within a particular structure that has been set for them, where they simply have to perform a ritual, the ritual of writing the dissertation, the outcomes are some of the things that we see that today many students are giving their work to mercenaries to write for them. They simply have to pay. Or even for those who write for themselves, it may not really empower them. It doesn't really empower them on how to, uh, first of all, frame a question to develop curiosity around something and how to investigate that thing, how to report it in a way that is uh, where they are personally invest invested, not just uh, presenting something that is seen as a partial requirement for fulfillment of what is needed to finish a particular uh, degree. Uh, where research skills are not well imparted and maybe students do not live without them, that is also going to affect how they, uh, their capacity to understand their environments is going to affect their capacity to, uh, to imagine what they can do in certain settings or even to, um, to get appreciation of where they are and what they need to do. Some of the outcomes are very clear. If you look around our societies, there is so much imitation. We could say that maybe 80% of our people are just imitating, or 80 could even be a low estimate. About 90% of our people could be just imitating. And by imitating, I mean simply reproducing what you have seen somewhere. Someone has started a shop here. You know, I also started a shop selling the same stuff nearby because I've seen they have so many customers. Someone has built a house with this uh, particular kind of um, design. Mine also has to look like that. And you find that the entire setting has houses that look almost the same. You can even imagine what is inside. Before you get there, you find that um, we are a society that pursues trends, trends even without questioning what the trend is exactly about. But just because we do not, we are not uh, skilled, first pause and ask, why should I do this? Why should I follow a particular convention? Why should I um, simply join? um a particular approach to doing things is it just because everyone is doing that or the, i must have a reason as to why i should do it is there an alternative way of approaching it so that should th that reminds us of the importance first of all of equipping our learners with uh, skills to imagine i cannot talk about specifically how we do that because it depends it can be approached differently in the different uh, disciplines, but the idea itself should be emphasized that we should emphasize imagination, we should emphasize creativity, we emphasize curiosity, we emphasize um, capacity to conduct research, and emphasize questioning. We have some bit of a disadvantage coming from many of our cultural contexts that our cultures do not really promote they discourage questioning, especially where it involves questioning elders, questioning those who are seen to be above us. But even when one is, a wrong, is wrong, an authority is wrong, and the question would have lead, question, questioning would have led to um, improving a way of doing something, we are hesitant to do that. We are hesitant to question them. We are hesitant to be critical to suggest that there could be alternative ways of doing it. Maybe this also contributes to our dictatorial tendencies uh, because even those in authority imagine that they are not supposed to be questioned coming from that cultural setting. So I think we need to do a lot in trying to, of course, maintain the value of respect, which we hold very dear in many of our African cultures, but where respect doesn't mean that you have to sheepish, sheepishly follow that you do not have uh, to question. Now, all that I've said clearly requires much more than what any particular discipline can provide. It requires much more than what we can imagine from within 
uh, our cocoons of uh, philosophy, of literature, of um, uh, whatever it is, there is a suggestion that we should move much more into working together, into looking at the complementarities of the different disciplines and what they bring to the table, and uh, into uh, projects that, just like this one, projects that bring in those leverage, those synergies, projects that uh, look so much into what we can learn from each other. Coming from philosophy, there is so much that I don't know uh, in medicine, for instance, but I know I can learn something from there. We have had, um, uh, we have, there, there are certain programs we are working on together with uh, public health, the School of Public Health, but there is a lot we have learned from the process, in the process. There is a lot they are learning from philosophy in terms especially of appreciating ethics, but there is also a lot that we are learning from their side on the side of uh, the science of things that we might not take seriously our side, yet it's important even in coming up with ethical, um, ethical in arriving at ethical judgments, you need to ground on certain factual understanding. So I beg to end, ben, uh, to, be, to end here. I know that is quite more complicated than this, but I maybe much more will come up in the questions and in the discussion. I thank you. Hello, Chair, can you? Yeah. Yes, uh, Chair, I've already submitted. I don't know whether Professor Mlua. Thank you so Uh, Dr. Oh, I, th I think there is Dr. something wrong with your network. You are not hearing it. That Matthias did. Me, Togo, he um, looked at issues that go beyond the traditional ways of teaching and learning in universities. He was very informative and perhaps provocative, I would say, at some point of his uh, presentations and discussion. Uh, he called about observations in exam setting, um, the holistic training of the learner, and queried the current paradigm of education, that education for who, for whom, and for what, and when. This, he um, challenged us to think out of the box in the same manner that the first presenter this afternoon of our panelist, Matthias, also did when he, he, he challenged the need for us to look beyond the, the, the current curriculums and, and systems. Um, for, for our panelists this, this afternoon, we'll give the floor to Ariel Sanchez. Ariel Sanchez is at the Earth University in Costa, in Costa Rica. Um, our viewers, those of you joining the webinar, you can make your chats and challenge our presenters to provide more information and clarifications as well as you can also go to the Q&A to put your questions. Sanchez, are we ready, Dr. Sanchez? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here just to, so I can, so you guys can see me. 
uh, for a little bit. I'm gonna cut the video so we can ensure we have a good connection. I don't know if there's a problem, if I can share my screen so I have a presentation to share with you. I think it will be uh, make our, our conversation more entertaining, a little bit more entertaining. Can you can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So basically, uh, we uh, my my conversation uh, today was going to be about how we uh, work around uh, the process of admitting new candidates or new students to our universities. So uh, uh, before we start, we I want to uh, talk about that. Uh, we usually uh, focus on bringing new students because our universities, our institutions have a particular mission. And as, 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 as uh, agents of, of, of teaching, of, of making students learn, we need to make sure that we are all fulfilling our institution's missions. Like for example, this is the, the Earth University mission on screen. So we, we want to attract students who are most likely to fulfill, to fulfill our institutional mission okay so most universities use standardized tests to measure the student's potential of achievement achievement okay so like for example most of you use uh, standardized testing like the college board sat or other uh, versions of standardized academic aptitude test so usually the criteria to admit students is to bring the students who get the highest scores okay so, however, if uh, in the case of your university, you are migrating to a competency-based education, educational model, as most of the higher educations are currently doing, academic, academic performance in college may be not, uh, in college tests may not, may not be the best predictor of their performance in their career. Okay, because as you know, when you apply academic aptitude tests, they focus on specific areas of learning, but not on soft skills or uh, sp uh, specific competencies related to the careers they're going to study. So um, that is why uh, we, analyze, we started analyzing this and, and analyzing is, the, is uh, an ac academic aptitude test enough to find the best candidates for our university, okay? So as an institution, and I'm sure you guys have also done the same, we have defined our graduation profile uh, and we have defined which are the specific uh, uh, capabilities and competencies we need our graduates to have once they finished our four, uh, their, uh, our four year program, okay? So we need to make sure that every, uh, well, at least try to make sure that all of our students who graduate from our programs have uh, this uh, competencies uh, developed well enough so they can be have a good performance uh, with their careers after graduation. So uh, I'm sure uh, most of you have a, 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 a graduation profile like this, but uh, you understand that many of these competencies and many of the competencies you expect or your alumni to have, they need to have some uh, level of development before they come to the university, okay? So, uh, so we are clear that many of these competencies as soft skills must have some development before entering our academic program. That is what we call the admissions profile. And for example, this is our admissions profile. And so uh, at this level of development, this, uh, for these competencies, it is, it is very difficult for an admissions aptitude test to uh, actually uh, measure how well developed the competencies we need for a student coming into our academic pro program has. Like for example, skills like, I'm sorry that this is in Spanish, but for example, competencies like maturity, if they have values, if they, if they can work in a team or have good teamwork skills, if they uh, have entrepreneurship potential, if they have uh, abilities to communicate, if they have good adaptation skills. So those are uh, uh, many soft skills that we, we want our incoming class to have before coming to the university, but an academic aptitude test may, might not be the best uh, uh, tool to, to do this. So moreover, I'm sure that many of you have learned through experience 
that the best graduates might not have always be the ones who scored the highest on their admissions tests, okay? So many of our graduates are probably successful because of the skills they already brought with them to a certain level of development. And these skills were uh, able, and, and also to the skills that they were able to develop while we're, they were with you, okay? Uh, uh, on uh, studying at the university and the technical knowledge you were able to pass to them as you facilitated their knowledge. So the analysis I want you to do here is uh, through your experience in the academy, you know that many times in class, we wish all of our students got the best grades. Okay, but sometimes grades are not the best predictor of, of success in the career after graduation. Okay, of course, they need the technical knowledge and the skills we provide them, but we, we need to make sure that they have certain level or, or potential to develop specific skills to be successful. Okay, so don't get me wrong. We, we also apply academic aptitude test to admit students. However, our focus is not choosing the, the students with the highest scores. In our case, okay, we don't look for the best grades. We look for the best candidates, okay? And so for that, we make sure that the academic aptitude test, uh, 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 when, when they take the test, they get the minimum grade to make sure they will be successful at our university courses. Because we, uh, I mean, they need to have a minimum le level of skills for math, for example, or for certain specific sciences related to our academic program, that we, we need to make sure that they have the least uh, required level of knowledge for them to be successful. But we don't look for the best grades. We look for the best candidates, okay? So uh, we are focused on uh, identifying uh, their potential in terms of specific values, their attitude towards learning in their career, and their potential to develop the basic competencies such as leadership, teamwork, innovation, or creativity, and communication, etc. So basically, we want our, uh, we want to to select candidates not on just on grades, but based on the competencies we know they need to have before coming to to our university. Because as uh, I, I like to make this uh, analogy, uh, if you are a chef, you are one of the best chefs in the world, and you're cooking a a, a, a plate of delicious food. It, it doesn't matter if you're the best chef in the world if you don't have the right ingredients before cooking your dish you won't get the, the, the delicious uh, dish you wanted to, uh, to, to prepare. So the, having the right ingredients is key to, to having successful, successful alumni out there in the world that will have the impact we require. Um, uh, we, we want our universities to make in our communities. So uh, uh, we use several tools to, to, to find out uh, which the best candidates are. Like, for example, we used uh, uh, traditional tools like personalized, personalized interviews. Like, for example, uh, we like to send our faculty members uh, to throughout the world because we get students from more than, than 50 countries around the world. So we usually send our faculty members to do personalized interviews. So we train them to do this and they usually uh, make sure that to conduct group interviews to uh, measure skills like teamwork communication uh, uh, adaptability and other skills and they also perform individual interviews to measure for example potential for entrepreneurship for vocation towards a career uh, and and to try to identify their their uh, attitude uh, uh, their attitude towards the career, the values, etc. Okay, and we have developed training, uh, a very uh, intricate training program to help our faculty, our faculty perform these interviews the best way possible. But in addition, because we know uh, 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 even though we can, we train them, we can list certain skills. Uh, we started using uh, other uh, other tools 
and innovational tools that we borrowed from other disciplines like human resources. So to reinforce this process, this process we started uh, using psychometric testing and axiology testing. And we use special tools like, for example, the disk index, the values index. The disk index me measures how the student will behave. The values index will measure what are the, mot the specific motivations or the, what are the things that uh, that, that move the student towards what they want to study, okay? And the axiology testing for the attribute index will tell us what is their baggage. I mean, what, what skills uh, has have more development with this candidate. So uh, uh, this allows our professors in charge of the selection interviews to get to know each of the candidates in a more personalized way. Uh, and an in in-depth uh, way before interviewing them face to face. So this is a, a, an excellent tool because if if a professor analyzes, uh, of course they get training for this. But if they can read and analyze information from this, they know specifically what are the race, the the best or the right questions to ask each candidate to evaluate if they have the right profile to come to the university. Of course, this requires a constant training of our faculty to help them uh, with the interpretation of the test. But we have seen very, very uh, positive uh, results. Like, for example, we uh, after students get admitted to the university, we run this uh, the same test during the first year, second year, third year, and even the fourth year to see how they have been um how what what has been the impact of our uh, of our education in their in their psychometric profile so uh, uh, this has helped us measure this impact okay and we have, have found a very strong and positive correlation between the test results and the the student retention retention uh, index and satisfaction rates this means that usually if 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 a student had the right psychometric profile before entering the university is the probability of him uh, staying at the university and not uh, 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 not leaving the university because of academic reasons is very high okay or be because of, of, of uh, 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 how do you say this uh, um, motivational issues or attitude issues is very low so usually if we we can uh, we, we using this tool we have found out, a way that improves our retention numbers, which means that students that come into the university are highly likely to finish their program and graduate and become the agent of change we, we want, which is which means fulfilling our, our institution's mission at the end. OK, so uh, it, this has also uh, become a very strong tool for our strategic enrollment management strategies, which in the end is something that's very uh, important for universities. We want to make sure that we have the right population so we can make our university sustainable in time and also uh, help our alumni create the impact we want when, once they graduate. So uh, to summarize, okay, um, our, pro our approach of selecting future uh, Earth agents of change is based on the evaluation of each candidate as an individual, not as a test result. Okay, and we try to measure the level of development of their key competencies prior to entering our academic program. Okay, so our experience has shown us that a student with the right attitude, the right values, and the right motivations, and with the potential to develop the key competencies that will allow us that will allow us to achieve the graduation profile we are looking for is much much more valuable than an academic aptitude test result okay so this allows us to reassure uh, to society that our alumni our graduate graduates will cause the impact we expect and allow us to fulfill our institutional mission and vision so basically we look for this a student with the right attitude, right values and motivations with the potential to develop the key competencies. Okay, so we work 
uh, you would say backwards. We look for the graduation profile. We want to, we look on uh, on how we want that, that student or that alumni to be after they go through our program. And uh, we know what can be built through our four year program. And we analyze we, what are the skills and competencies they need to have before. And if you do the same exercises, uh, you will discover that uh, test results are not the, the, the best measure to find out what profile you need for admission. So uh, as I tell you, we don't substitute uh, the, the academic aptitude test because it tells you the minimum level of, of performance they need to have to survive our classes. But uh, we have discovered that that is not the most important uh, uh, measure to admit a student. The most important uh, uh, indicator to admit a student is their profile and their potential to become the, our graduation uh, profile in the end. Okay, so that that would be my 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 col my, my uh, collaboration for for this afternoon. Uh, and uh, of course, in the end, uh, if you have any questions about how we do this, um, I'm glad to share it with you guys. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ariel Sanchez. That was very, very informative. Sanchez has just presented the admissions process, the admissions requirement and expectations of the F Institute, the F University in Costa Rica, in which he presented the strategic enrollment uh, management st strategies meaning that to get a graduate, they worry a lot also about the quality of the candidate they are admitting, because at, at the end of the day, they have established that there is a strong correlation between the quality of the candidate in the admission process and how the graduate turns out. And in the, in the, in the admission process, effort is put on not only the academic competence and intellectual capacity of the candidate, but also on issues of values, of motivations, attitudes, and other societal re relations. So that's a tall order and a tough challenge for most of the universities in the continent of Sub-Saharan Africa, where we are still doing mass education in which candidates um, in living schools and high schools are being massively absorbed into tertiary, into tertiary institutions, uh, the the low going candidate per candidate. But I think we are going to have an opportunity to interact more with um, Ariel Sanchez on how um, this this can be uh, uh, how we can overcome this challenge. Our next pre presentation, we will invite Professor Justine Namalwa from Makerere University of Uganda to tell us about social experiences in universities. Over to you, Professor Justin. Uh, thank you so much, our moderator. Allow me, okay. Yeah, thank you so much, our moderator. And uh, I'm glad I'm glad that I'm speaking after my colleagues that have concentrated a lot on the education and what we are doing. Allow me mute my video for better connectivity and I'm honored to be here. The previous speakers have concentrated a lot on what we do in these universities, what we give to these learners when they come to the universities. I'm humbled that when I was contacted by Roof Forum to be part of this series, I was given a topic that is very close to my heart, and that is safeguards. And I'm asking myself, all that we are talking about so far is the capacity building for these young people to enable them to be meaningful in society. But which environments are we bringing them to? Are the learning environments safe? Are the learning environments conducive? I'll use my five, seven minutes just to flash on that, to put our reflection on the learning environment. We know that almost all universities around the world have had a traditional focus on specific areas of safeguarding. Many of the universities 
like Makere, where I come from, has put a lot of emphasis on anti-sexual harassment, guarding against sexual harassment, especially for these young people. There are many policies and practices in place to ensure that sexual harassment, sexual harassment is guarded against. Now, it's time to ask ourselves, is safeguarding all about anti-sexual harassment? Are these young people, young men and women, facing more, many more harsh conditions beyond and above safeguarding? So as institutions on call today, we need to evaluate our universities in terms of compliance to the broad understanding of social safeguards. If we want these young people to have a meaningful engagement at the university and to come out as people that are skilled, equipped, and ready to transform societies, they must thrive in an environment that is conducive. So it's time for all of us to reflect and have a holistic evaluation of these institutions where we are coming from. How safe, how conducive is the environment we are dealing with? Definitely, <clears throat> we should be cognizant of the increasing concerns and emerging needs to address the different risks and the safety for students, staff, and all the other stakeholders that operate within the institutional frameworks. Please remember that even when you talk about our students, they're not homogeneous, they're heterogeneous group. So we have to be inclusive and thinking with diversity. Think about, uh, Spire talked about humanities and sciences. Students in these different campuses or these different uh, colleges face different uh, risks. I'll take an example from where I come from, which is science best. Have we thought about the safeguarding in the laboratories where the students are engaging with these experiments? Have we thought about when the student teachers go out on um, teaching practices, the kind of risks and safeguarding required when they are going out on teaching practices. So we need to be diverse in thought and practices. Have we thought about this to the teachers as well? The staff, we were, we are all equal affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. People are still struggling from the psychosocial trauma of COVID-19 and other related calamities. Do we even remember that the, the staff are equally humans? And the moment the staff is not safe, the moment the staff is not psychologically okay, what he or she delivers to these students will be way below what is expected. So we need to know that both the students and the staff vary in terms of exposure to the different risks. So we need to be aware that providing a safe and conducive environment is critical to ensuring that the staff University programs and operations are going to run smoothly and effectively to achieve the strategic missions of our institutions. I listened in very well to the colleague from Costa Rica and I asked myself, after all these processes, the tedious processes of identifying talent beyond academic grades, what do our institutions have to offer? Because we all know that if however bright you may be, however talented you may be, but you're living in an environment that is not conducive, that is not safe, you actually get a brain lockdown. We need to be concerned about the drivers and challenges that may affect the learning experience. The first speaker talked about the learning experience. Spire talked about the learning experience. What are those underlying factors beyond the academic potential of the student? that may challenge the learning experience. We have to note that one bad experience, either seen, witnessed, or shared on social media may cause trauma and fear for many others, including potential applicants. Just one video clip making grounds on social media about University X in terms of social safeguards may even deter potential applicants, or may affect somebody who has one year to go. They live in fear and 
based on what we've been talking about, that will challenge the ability to be creative and to be innovative. What are we speaking to now? As in the 21st century responsive university on call today, we should purpose and be intentional on enhancing the safety and well being measures as one of the pathways for us to realize the institutional strategic visions, which is to empower these young people to give the knowledge and skills. That's our vision, but is the environment providing for that? We need to note. Depending on where we are coming from, there are some non-risk areas. Sometimes we tend to actually overlook. We tend, for example, at Macquarie University, we've had a lot of efforts on fighting sexual harassment. Anything that relates to sexual harassment for the young people, they've been put a lot of strong measures, but is that all? Are we aware of other risks that we need to take care of? Take for example, in the academic spaces, listening to the colleague from Costa Rica, after going through all those hustles and bustles of identifying talent, the learning spaces they are in, the lecture rooms, the laboratories, the libraries, have we taken care of the social safeguards beyond sexual harassment? I know sexual harassment is the biggest evil, correct, but there are also those evils may not sound big, but if it happens to one individual, it will affect their performance on their journey in a particular institution. Have we thought about the accommodation spaces? In many of the universities, we have accommodation spaces outside the university premises. Do we even get to know? Do we even get to know how these operations are going on? Do we get to know the risks that happen in these particular spaces? All that goes on there actually affects the students we are talking about, affects the learning that we are talking about. We talk about administrative and support services spaces. There are many spaces, the libraries, the administrative offices, a lot goes on. A lot of torture goes on to those students. Do we think about them? Are we ready to take on the mantle to safeguard these spaces? Now, when the students are with us at the university, we, could, we can do as much. We can put in measures, we can put in restrictions and put in monitoring systems. I pose a question to all of us. There are moments when they go out to the field to do research, to be in internship placements, to engage in different institutions. How much influence do we have? How much relationship have we discussed in terms of continued safeguarding of these young people? The student may be very well protected at the university. They go out for an internship placement and that ruins the experience because of limited safeguarding in those spaces. Then we ask ourselves as institutions, as universities, how much more can we do? How far can we stretch our mandate to influence safety and well-being of these young people when they are engaging on the different experiences to make them the people we want to be? as they graduate from these universities. Do we think about when they're in their social engagements? Yes, we often say, by the time they come to the universities, they are adults. But if we want to nurture them to be those responsible citizens that are gonna influence and transform society, we have a role to play in their social spheres. The question is, how much more, how far can we stretch to influence their social spheres? On this note, Allow me to zoom in a little bit on what have we done as a university at Makere and what are we learning from other partner institutions to enhance safeguarding. We are cognizant that almost all universities have segments or pockets providing for safeguarding in different institutional frameworks. What we ask ourselves, do we have the, are we able to monitor and follow through the different segments? Should all universities work towards having a comprehensive safeguarding policy or institutional framework to cater for this very critical element? Of course not. Different universities, depending on where they are right now in terms of safeguards, may take a different approach. What have we done at Makere? As a university, we have different pockets of safeguarding provided for. But of course, we have a holistic 
policy on anti-sexual harassment, including many others. In this time and era, working with different partners and development agencies, we've been called upon, could we put all these pockets together? Could we see a comprehensive policy on safeguarding? And that is the journey that Macquarie University is moving. This is in the context of what MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program envisions safety and well being of young people. And that's where we are coming from. So, as a university, we are on the road to develop a comprehensive safeguarding policy. And this particular policy is not by the university, but by the young people. It is youth led, and we are having all stakeholders on board the students, and we take note that we tend to a university like Makere, where we have a bigger proportion of undergraduate students, we tend to forget about the graduate students, thinking they are usually more adults and usually not resident at the campus, but we are very cognizant of these categories. We are cognizant of inclusivity. We have students with disabilities. We have refugee students. We have different categories of students. We need to take note that each of these may require provision I know somebody will ask, how far can we stretch? We first need to map all stakeholders and then later see those that have similarities and then we can have provisions to take care of those groups. Then the category of the academic staff. We are sometimes the subjects or the, the cause of the, some of the safeguarding measures. We need to be on board from the time these policies are being conceptualized but not to wait to be told to implement them. This staff, both academic and administrative, need to partake of the safeguarding measures. And then we have partners in student welfare. If your university is having students residing in hostels outside the university premises, those are key partners because a lot of things happen in the students' halls of residences, in the accommodation spaces, in the social spaces, how can we get in partnership with these private sector players, but to play a role in safeguarding and wellness of our students? Partners in training. We've talked about where we send students for internships, for apprenticeship, for student teacher trainers, and people doing education. How much can we go or how far can we go? Are we able to have a comprehensive risk mapping, identify the sources, and extent of risk that the students and staff are subject to, and together identify the desirable actions to address these risks. One of the challenging areas in terms of safeguarding is reporting and management of these incidences. An aspect of confidentiality, an aspect of immediate response when an incident has happened. How do we handle this? Quite often, Many of the victims of social safeguards shy away because they don't want to be subjected to torture of come and appear before committee, provide this evidence, appear before committee X and committee Y. It's the reason many of the young people choose to stay away and say, I'll live with it. But between you and me, you know, you can never live with it. You swallow it and living with it means you live in torture for the rest of your life. How then can we as institutions we talk about a safe environment, but how safe is it if a victim of sexual harassment has to appear before a committee to defend him or herself that I was actually sexually harassed? That's already double torture. So the aspect of confidential and responsive mechanisms of managing these incidences is critical. If we are going to provide a safe learning environment that later will deliver that creative thinker, that entrepreneur, that confident and skilled individual that we've been talking about this whole afternoon. And then finally, do we have points of contact? Do we have room for peer engagements? We have found through this uh, engagement in the university that peer groups, body groups within the students, you will find students sharing more amongst themselves than coming to a focal point at a college or uh, an institution where they're supposed to report. Now, noting that coming out to report and defend an incident is another level of torture. 
our call as institutions is, can we focus on prevention? Can we do whatever it takes to prevent incidences? Because we have realized that reporting and going through the management of these incidents is equally a challenge. The best we can offer these young people as we nurture them to be responsible citizens and entrepreneurs is to prevent the incidences. For all the policies we are drafting, for all the policies we are reviewing, can we focus on prevention? Can we work with the young people? Let's not create policies for them. Let's create policies with them. Let them be part of what we want to achieve. It's not for the university, it's actually for them because universities are spaces for young people to come and acquire knowledge and skills. So let's work together to develop these practices, policies and modalities that shall prevent incidences from occurrences. And then we shall be able to bring students to the universities. We nurture them, support them and empower them to be responsible citizens. Thank you so much for this opportunity in the interest of time. I've been guided to keep it short and I'll appreciate to engage more beyond these few minutes. I thank you again, moderator, the forum and all the colleagues on call. Thank you so back. much. Thank you so much, Professor Justin Namalwa of Makerere University on your presentation on safeguards and well-being of students and learners. You evoked and highlighted a whole lot of issues which um, builds in and ties up with what the other presenters have, have presented, you know, so that at the end of the day, we can have a comprehensive and holistic process in the, in the knowledge transmission process. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is the second webinar in, in preparation for the 19th Roof Forum AGM that will be held in Yaoundé, Cameroon as from the 28th of October. So we have taken off with some knowledge processes and this and discussion. This afternoon, we had presenters, uh, panelists on the team, uh, university processes, systems, and better experiences in higher education learning. We listened to uh, Matthias, where Matthias spoke about skills for competitiveness and thriving in the, in the market. Then this was, was followed by um, the next speaker, Jimmy, who spoke about um, the need for holistic learning, uh, holistic learning, learning processes, rethinking learning in higher education. And then Ariel Sanchez came in, the director of admissions at the Earth University came in on how to rethink the entry and admissions process into, into higher education. And, and before that, we had our host, Professor Okori, the executive secretary of Ruforum, who welcomed us. And we also had the um, introductory speech, introductory address from a board member of the forum, Professor Ufe Chinje, director of the University of Ngahondiri. The, the chat box has been very, very active. The Q&A has been very, very active. And I noticed that, I noticed that the, the presenters have been interacting with, interacting in the chat box, addressing the questions as they came up. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, we have um, our keynote speaker who may be having a little bit of scientific challenges, but he's, he has just joined us. Our keynote speaker this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, is Professor Francis Peterson. Professor Francis Peterson is the rector and vice chancellor of the University of the Free State in South Africa. The University of the Free State, as is, he, he may decide to tell us, is one of the well-established Foundation Universities of South Africa. Welcome, Professor uh, Francis Peterson. And we are expecting to listen to you on your uh, keynote on the issue of, of um, energizing, reforming, improving, and revitalizing higher education. Thank you, Professor Francis Peterson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I'm going to share my screen, and you must just indicate to me whether you, uh, um, whether you can see that. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll do the presentation. I'm pretty sure that uh, I just want to check whether I can put it on slideshow. 515, uh, excellent. Uh, excellent. Yeah, okay, that's fantastic. Um, Chair, I'm, I'm going to try to 
to to I don't know whether I should switch off my camera just to protect some uh, some bandwidth. But let me uh, first of all start by saying that uh, um, thank you for the opportunity to address you uh, today, uh, and I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to convey some thoughts uh, to you on the topic of transforming university processes, uh, systems, and learning experience, and also share with you some experiences and perhaps some insights uh, that we have arrived at our own continued uh, transformation journey uh, at the University of the Free State here in South Africa. And we often say it's in the heartland of South Africa, in the center of South Africa. Uh, it's a university that, uh, that hosts about 42,000 students, just over 5,000 staff. We have three campuses and then you can see on my slides, those three campuses are represented there, uh, some snapshots on how the campuses look like. Uh, and uh, we are a comprehensive university that uh, um, provide our offerings through seven faculties. Uh, and most of what you would find in every any comprehensive established university in terms of program offerings, you would find here uh, at the University of the Free State. So the, the challenges confronting our societies today, whether those challenges are locally, whether they are regionally, or whether they are globally, are becoming increasingly complex uh, in nature. And, and hence, if you provide an, an, an solution to those challenges, those solutions should always be an integrated solution, taking into account uh, the impacts of, 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 of different aspects of society. And so often, in order to arrive to these integrated solutions, uh, which are also practically implementable, but also should be sustainable, uh, we need to adopt a, a multidisciplinary and or a transdisciplinary approach or strategy. Uh, we need to approach these confronting our communities. Uh, uh, we need to confront these issues. Uh, um, that confront our communities and our higher education sector uh, from different angles, drawing on diverse uh, expertise from various fields in various contexts. And I believe that uh, by drawing on, a, uh, on one another's expertise and experiences in this particular way, in this particular, on this particular platform, uh, in forums such like this, we can co-create knowledge um, and arrive at solutions that um, are speedily and also more effectively addressing those challenges. Uh, and, uh, and, and we can provide those, those solutions to the benefit of not only individual institutions, uh, but the entire higher education sector on the continent. So my, um, my presentation uh, uh, start with the first slide where I look at the challenges facing higher education in general. And I think it's important to indicate that we are living in a world that is not only complex, uh, uh, but is also constantly changing uh, and increasingly uncertain. Globally, we, we, we face uh, many interrelated challenges, including economic disparities, um, food insecurity, Environmental degradation is, a, is, is one of them. Climate change, as we all know, uh, quite a debatable topic. And also political instability. Now we've seen that on the continent, but we also see that in the globe. Uh, and, and, and I think the one, the war, the war uh, uh, in Sudan, the Ukraine, Russia war, we are just some examples of this political instability. Now in the world, in this particular world, um, the role that universities are playing as engines of social mobility and drivers of the economy, and also as generators of news ideas, is more critical than ever. And due to the universal nature of knowledge, universities are actually global in their scope. But they are also deeply entrenched in their local context. So at universities, we encourage uh, 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 university campuses as spaces that encourage new ideas, 
that hopefully encourages controversy, inquiry and argument and challenge the orthodox views that societies might have. That is what we would like to see at universities. But, but in South Africa, as elsewhere in Africa, growth, unemployment, poverty, and inequality have been persistent areas of concern. And against this background, there's an increased expectation of universities to provide skills, build the economy, solve persistent social problems, and assist with transforming societies. This progressively outward focus lines up with our mandate as universities, a mandate that perhaps have shifted over the years from a purely academic focus to a more society focused role. And that mandate is to use our core functions as a university. And the core functions are referred to here as teaching and learning, as research and perhaps innovation. And then how do we engage with our communities in a scholarly fashion? Uh, uh, and, and we often, globally, the term is used engaged scholarship to address societal needs. In other words, to be powerful breaches between knowledge systems and the cultural, social, political, and economic spheres. In order to fulfill this particular mandate, we need to be prepared to continuously renew and reimagine ourselves to ensure the retention of vi our vitality and also our relevance. We are living in a time of vast, rapid and unprecedented changes in specifically the realm of technology and the influence on the world of work is immense. And we've seen that specifically after COVID, uh, what impact uh, that has been. So workplace requirements are in a state of constant flux and it is vital that institutions of higher learning constantly evaluate themselves and adapt themselves when needed in order to produce graduates who are sought after in a global workplace. And this particular adaptability cuts across our teaching and learning. It cuts across our curriculum content and offering, our research areas, and in particular, our focus of our research areas. What are we focusing on? What research we are doing? And how we actually are doing that research. But it also requires that we constantly review systems and policies and processes to enable institutional agility and institutional efficiency. And this readiness to change and adapt ensures that we remain relevant and vibrant in the face of an altering higher education landscape. I believe that we should do more than merely just survive current and future changes. And, and, and in particular, as African universities, we should aim to grow, to develop, and to thrive, continuing to influence and impact the world, both locally and globally. And, and, and that's an that's important area to reflect on, perhaps. And I want to remind uh, the audience that uh, we celebrated Africa Day uh, last week, on the 25th of May, uh, where we had an opportunity to, uh, um, to reflect on Africa's contribution to global knowledge, um, and that Africa's knowledge should have their rightful place in global knowledge. And I think the globe, the northern part, if you take a look at the global north, particularly, and also if you look at global knowledge in general, there is an appreciation that African knowledge, the knowledge from institutions, universities, from the African continent, the engagement with universities, 
on the African continent. The mobility of students between not only one direction from Africa to the globe, but from the globe into Africa. The, uh, um, the joint uh, offering of, uh, um, of academic programs, the joint teaching, that there is so, so much that the African continent could contribute in a co-created fashion. And Africa Day and perhaps Africa Month uh, give us that opportunity to showcase what Africa can do for the world and what we can do collectively if you want to deal with, uh, with the sort of inequalities that, uh, that, 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 that we find uh, in the world today. So ultimately, we do not operate in isolation, but form part of a global knowledge community. And we want to contribute towards that community with a societal relevant knowledge in a real world application. And that leads me to developments uh, in the core functions of the universities. Now, adapting our society focused role has also brought about significant developments in our core functions as universities, spurred by a rapid growth, challenge, development, improvements in technology, the burgeoning of uh, um, digitalization and hybrid learning, as well as the massification perhaps of higher education, especially on the African continent. So at the University of the Free State, we have undergone substantial transformation and realignment in all three of our core functions, which I referred to earlier. Those of teaching and learning, research and innovation, we can probably add to that, research, innovation, and internationalization, and engaged scholarship. Cognizant of the changing realities and the needs of a high-performance 21st century African university that is globally, nationally, continentally, but also regionally relevant. So allow me, uh, Mr. Program Director, to elaborate for just a few minutes on developments that we have informed our University of the Free State teaching and learning strategies in particular. So amongst our, um, amongst our strategic goals as an institution, we also reflect on our teaching and learning environment. And that is to improve student success and well-being, to renew and transform uh, the curriculum, to increase our contribution to local, regional and global knowledge, and to advance an institutional culture that demonstrates the values of the institution. And in pursuing these goals, we believe it is to be all important to keep in mind the kind of graduate that we want to produce. So what is the kind of graduate that we would like to leave, to, to see in graduating and leave the University of the Free State in particular. And hopefully that sort of thinking could also inform other thoughts uh, uh, in other universities on the continent and elsewhere. So there's an increasing onus on higher education institutions to produce graduates who are employable and ready to contribute to the world of work. This requires skills, knowledge and attributes that graduates will develop and demonstrate beyond their studies, enhancing their employability. At the University of the Free State, we have identified aspects such as critical thinking, problem solving, very importantly, ethical reasoning, oral and written communication, community engagement, that social responsiveness component, and an entrepreneurial mindset to supplement academic competence as I envisioned graduate attributes. But equipping our graduates with these attributes remains a pipe dream unless we develop and implement systems and identify 
measurable outcomes, facilitating the incorporation into our teaching learning strategies and also our day-to-day -day operation. Which is why we have been engaged in a systematic process of mapping graduate attributes to the curriculum across our different programs and faculties. And this in fact ensures that the attributes are integrated into the curricula, but also very importantly, the co-curricular uh, um, programs throughout a student's journey, accompanied by a continuous process of reviewing and improving our practices. Another of our strategic teaching and learning priorities is to have student learning in success as focal points. Our definition of student success entails increasing the number of graduates from diverse backgrounds. And we were talking in some of the earlier talks about inclusivity, uh, equality, fairness, while decreasing achievement gaps and participating in high quality learning that results in attributes that are personally, professionally, but also socially valuable. A value of holistic support initiatives in achieving this can never be overemphasized. And again, at the University of the Free State, our support initiatives have directly led to improved student success rates. These initiatives include academic support in the form of academic advising, language and, and writing programs, as well as tutorial initiatives. But that should also be coupled, as we talk about student well-being, coupled to uh, psychological or psychosocial support provided by our Department of Student Counseling and Development, and which consists of individual counseling, group sessions, and workshops. And it was quite fascinating during COVID as we de as we increase or in in integrate uh, um, technology, we also have digital uh, social support sessions with our students. We also have several peer support initiatives, helping students to negotiate often uh, challenging transition from school level, secondary school to tertiary education. Our aim is to have a decolonized curriculum. And that in itself, Mr. Program Director, is a, is a topic on its own for discussion. But that, 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 that decolonized curriculum that draws on locally relevant research and will reference global issues more comprehensively. We want to include voices, developments, and scholarship, both locally and globally, that may have never that may have been excluded in the past. And in fact, again, reflecting back to Africa Day, that's, a good, that's an excellent opportunity to, uh, to showcase knowledge from the African con uh, continent as a key component of global knowledge. So as with graduate attributes, it's important that something like curriculum reform does not just say or stay a debating point, or a topic for endless discussion, but it really evolves into a systematic process that leads to a real and comprehensive change. The adaptation of programs based on employer feedback, technological advancements, and the changing societal needs are essential to maintaining relevance and building a sustained culture of continuous improvement. And that linked to another strategic point that we have put emphasis on at the University of the Free State. And that's a point and area of transformation in teaching and learning that has been around creating a flexible learning and teaching design. This involves developing a hybrid or blended learning environment which involves or using innovative course design to create a flexible learning environment where students can learn in different ways, but also 
at different times. This also involves equipping students and lecturers with the digital literacy skills necessary in order to successfully and effectively navigate the digital realm. So with our comprehensive digitalization strategy, we aim to find the best way of using information and communication technologies for enhancing learning, research, collaboration, but also decision making. And digitalization at higher education institutions has become inevitable and probably, I would say, uh, non negotiable. So, how crucially important uh, 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 digitalization has become. Not only because of a greater flexibility, I would say, or convenience and learning options they create, but because digital processes in itself are a core element in preparing students for a dynamic world of work in which technology takes the center stage. A final teaching and learning priority I want to touch on is quality focused research led teaching and learning. It is an undisputed fact that quality is one of the central drivers ensuring university survival in the 21st century. Students would come to a university if they believe that they would receive quality education, quality teaching and learning, quality support. So quality in learning and teaching has increasingly become focused on evidence that helps us to understand how students think, how students behave, and how students learn, as well as what they are able to do on completion of their higher, edu higher uh, education qualifications. And again, at our university, University of the Free State, we have been exploring the tremendous potential of using effective and advanced data analytics in order to help us achieve that quality. Data analytics in higher education enhances the evidence-based focus and student data can be used to develop algorithms and software solutions to provide individual feedback to students on their progress and refer them to relevant support systems. And in that regard, we are currently uh, um, working with a large funder foundation uh, from the States on a, an, an seven year project where we can effectively track students at the individual basis in terms of what support they need to be able to success uh, fully complete their degree holistically. That means student success, all the things that I've mentioned before, but also the well being component. With these two systems working in tandem, data analytics on the one hand, an effective and comprehensive system of academic, psychological, and social support on the other, the university has been able to work effectively towards ensuring student success and to record amongst the highest institutional success rate in South Africa. So Chair, let, let me take uh, and look at the transforming of processes and systems, but coupled with that, the development, the real thinking, innovative thinking in terms of governance, and to develop policies that really care about individuals. Uh, uh, so if we, we believe that as an institution, University of the Free State, we are a caring institution, we are a student-centered institution, but we actually are a people-centered institution, which means it's not only focusing on the student as the, as the center, but also our staff are, um, are, being, are being put into the center. So by, uh, um, by elucidating these aforementioned aspects of the University of the Free State teaching and learning strategy, I want to draw your attention to an important fact that having a vision 
a plan, or even a transformation agenda, or even a strategy is an important starting point. But this needs to be followed and underpinned by sound and effective processes and systems that can turn that vision or strategy or plan into reality. What is equally important is that these processes and systems are also subjected to review, robust review and transformation in order to ensure that they remain relevant and that they remain effective and lead to the outcomes we desire. In our education institutions, the processes and systems that we put in place have a direct effect on student experience and also reflect our institutional values, which is why all the processes containing the student life cycle, and that is now from recruitment, we recruit students into the organization, into the university, uh, and the whole application process and the graduation process that can hopefully lead to employability need to be carefully and systematically considered and reviewed to ensure relevance and effectiveness and ultimately enhance the student experience. And then, just as important, these processes and systems need to be supported by an environment of excellence, we talked about quality earlier, excellence, environment of care, and also an environment of a sense of belonging. So likewise, the policies of higher education institutions need to be current and relevant, aligned with our own institutional values, aligned with the national legislation or each of the countries, as well as the regional and global priorities, such as the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. A crisp, relevant and well-communicated policy environment is essential for university communities to function opt optimally and with integrity. And I want to emphasize probably perhaps in that context, because we often have these discussions, when we talk about national economies and investment in national economies, it should only should be crisp, relevant, and well communicated. It also needs to be policies that are certain. So you're not going to make investment. You need to make sure that these policies won't change next year or the year after that. The policy environment needs to be an environment that uh, uh, um, uh, express that level of certainty and that obviously is also a key component at the university of the free state we strive for a strong rule-based and consistent governance structure with a single line of accountability and student administration across all faculties and campuses and i and i through you program director i want our delegates not to view rule-based as there is no opportunity to challenge rules. There are actually ample opportunity to challenge rules, but you need to have rules in place first to challenge them. And, uh, and one need to understand how that's been challenged, how the different views are incorporated. Uh, and, and that's the environment that universities need to create. Our aim is a fully automated system with data integrity across the student life cycle and value chain. Our institution has had various transformation initiatives over the years, culminating in our integrated transformation plan. And in short, if you walk on the campuses of the University of the Free State, our three campuses, you often would hear the word ITP. That's the acronym for Integrated Transformation Plan with a comprehensive consultation process preceding its development from 2017. The ITP signal our commitment to widen the scope and radically accelerate transformation at our university, but transformation defined in a holistic manner focused on the mandate of the university. It identified a number of work streams addressing our core functions of teaching and learning, 
research, innovation and internationalization, and, and engage scholarship. It also addresses our university culture, comprising of student experience, staff experience. We're looking at staff composition, student composition, looking at names, symbols and spaces at the university on our campuses and also universal, ex universal access. We must never forget about uh, um, students and staff with disabilities, but it also addresses structural issues, namely our financial model, our financial framework, our governance, our system policy, and our administration. That is the holistic approach that the ITP assessed, looked at, came up with interventions, plans, and that is what we worked on since 2018. The work done in all these work streams has been informed by the understanding that universities are complex organizations that require the management of people, the management of processes, of physical resources and finances in such a way that they can deliver on their specific purpose. So the integrated transformation program or, or, or a plan expressed our aspiration to be a truly transformed university within attributes that speaks to social justice, and I believe student success is a social justice imperative, where diverse people feel a sense of common purpose, where the symbols and spaces, systems, and daily practices all reflect commitment to openness and engagement that responds to the needs of the local community, because we must never forget where we are located, locality, and uh, uh, is quite important, while at the same time participates in global knowledge production. That has engaged actively with its colonial, and in our case, our apartheid legacies, and which recognize its common humanity and the universal nature of intellectual endeavor. And we believe part of the ITP, the Integrated Transformation Plan, is that we want to create a place and perhaps a space for competing views, disagreements, and sometimes even discomfort. And again, it is vital that a vision for transformation does not stay merely a vision but it actually involves in a tangible, practical strategy with systems in place to carefully facilitate and monitor and even perhaps evaluate its physical implementation and uptake in the university community, which is why our integrated transformation plan also set out clear deliverables by the cross-functional task, task teams led by conveners putting in place a mechanism to manage the process of transformation and governing it. So we, we find ourselves currently almost in the middle of 2023. I can program director proudly say that the aims and the principles in our integrated transformation plan have become largely embedded in the operational structures of our university. And that, in fact, forms the basis of future strategic thinking. It has transitioned to our new strategic focus as a university, which is Vision 130, which is an elaboration of our strategic intent of leading up to 2034, where our institution will celebrate a 130th uh, uh, birthday. So Vision 130 is centering around establishing the university as a university of choice for exceptional students, for exceptional academics, and for exceptional support staff, as well as to continue to create 
a vibrant, safe space with an acceptance of constructive, robust, and critical engagement. It focuses on our societal impact, underpinned by our institutional values that, that, that speaks to excellence, it speaks to innovation and impact, speaks to accountability, to care, very important, to social justice, and to sustainability. And it is the proceeding largely inward focus on a comprehensive transformation containing the systems and processes of our integrated transformation plan that has enabled us to progress to the outward focus on societal development embodied in our exciting new vision and our strategy. I've often said that transformation is a process, a journey rather than a destination. A truly transformed or transforming institution is one that continuously evaluates itself, herself, as to whether it is fulfilling the role and purpose. In our case, whether we are responding effectively to the needs of society. It is vital that we continuously reflect on our systems, our processes, and learning experiences aligned with our societal focus role, as well as our institutional values. But it's equally vital that reflection evolves into real action, spilling over into a transformation of our systems, our processes, our governance, and our policies, ensuring that we stay relevant and that we very importantly stay true to our mandate and keeping on making a real impact on the societies we serve. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Peters, University of the Free State, South Africa, who has it has been a two important information, important to transformative higher education um, agenda processes, systems, and learning experience. And our keynote speaker, Professor, his experiences from his university, the University of the Free State in South Africa, where he touched on the key on the key issue of integrated transformation plan as basis for future strategic planning for the University of the Free State and in achieving the Agenda 130 when the university will be celebrating its 130th anniversary. We have done well with time and based on the schedule that was given to us, we are we are about uh, ra ra rounding up. Um, it's been your moderator this evening. We want to thank the keynote speaker and panelists. We want to thank the executive secretary of Ru of Ru Forum, who was our host, Professor um, Okori. We want to thank the board member, Pro Professor uh, Florence Ufechinje. Or rector of the University of Ngaoundere. You also had greetings from the University of Bamenda, Professor Teresa Ku Akenji, and the students of the University of Bamenda who sent their greetings to, to the entire revision that will stay focused for more announcements for other webinars that will be announced in the, in, in the nearest future. And for regular updates, you stay in touch with the Ruforum, Ruforum website. Until then, I've been your humble moderator, Professor Ernest Litiamulwa, the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Cooperation and Relations with the Business World of the University of Bamenda, the University of the Future. Thank you so much and good night. <laughs>